Hi, I'm Tracy Watts. Welcome to Mercer Health News. My guest today is Paris Garg. Paris is a partner at Oliver Wyman in their health and life sciences practice, and she works with health plans and providers. And so, Paris, thank you so much for joining me today. Welcome. Of course, happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Looking forward to the discussion. So, Paris, let's start with virtual care. I really want to kind of pick your brain on this topic. From our survey data, we know that 94% of employers have telemedicine programs. And we have another survey that we did of actual employees, 2000 employees across the US. It's called our Health on Demand Survey. And we found that 75% of them said that they had used virtual care during this pandemic and that they plan to continue to use it going forward, even when you know in-person care is available again. And I'm just curious from your perspective, especially working with the health plans, what do you think virtual care looks like in the future? And is there anything that employers should be doing now to prepare for that and to really take advantage of what the health plans are doing? It's a great question, Tracy. So in the past, what used to happen is virtual care was viewed as an add-on sort of service, right? Something that you availed of only if you couldn't get to a physical location. And so big companies in this space said, look, you know, I have this huge network of physicians. These guys are present all over the United States and it doesn't matter, right? Like if you need a quick urgent care visit, I will get you in through this virtual platform. Through the pandemic, as you know, and as you pointed out, right, usage of telemedicine peaked pretty significantly. And you said 75% of individuals had used it. What we're seeing as physical capabilities are coming back online is one, that usage rate of 75% has gone down closer to you know, 50%. We're never going to go back to pre-pandemic levels, but I don't believe that we're ever going to be in a place where we're at pandemic levels either. So that's one takeaway. Second thing that we're discovering is that while people use telemedicine during the pandemic as a stopgap measure, in the future, what people are looking for is a more connected ecosystem of offerings. And so you don't just view telemedicine as something that you do in a pinch, but it's something that is an additional modality to give you better access to care. And not just better access to care anywhere, but better access to your physician. And so what we're hearing people say and what we're hearing health plans look for now is a way to have a multimodal system that offers virtual care, but also offers a companion physical care offering. So people can feel that when they want to talk to a physician, they can utilize telemedicine. And then when they need to actually see a physician, they're not trying to bridge the gap between a national telemedicine vendor that has no connection back to the individual physician that they're seeing. I'll say one more thing and then um, we can discuss this response. The challenge here is ensuring that you don't end up in a place where each physician has its own platform and its own sign-in, right? As a consumer, as you know, right? And have probably experienced through the pandemic, it can be painful, right? Like I already have, I think nine or 10 different login informations for all of the different physicians that I deal with. And so some way to think about how you streamline that a little bit for consumers and for employers is, is going to be the challenge in this uh, path forward, I believe. I agree. I do think the connectivity issue is a big issue, especially for consumers. The other issue that I worry about is cost. During the pandemic, the virtual visits that a patient could do with their own provider were billed at the office level. Um, charge. And for many of the standalone telemedicine programs, those office visits, um, you know, go for around $40, maybe $50, mm -hmm. which is about half the cost of an office visit. And I think that we definitely want to get to this longitudinal care that that is the, you know, the holy grail for all of us. But how are we going to do it in a way that is a lot more cost effective? Are you seeing movement on the carrier side to begin to resolve for that? Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's a great question. And I'll tell you a couple of other stories 
that we came across as we went through this, right? So what we discovered as health plans started paying for telemedicine services, right? Or large employers started paying for telemedicine services, things that you weren't charged for previously, all of a sudden you were getting charged for. Perfect example is prescription refills. You know, historically I would just call my physician and I would say, hey, I need a refill. And they would call the pharmacy and it would all be taken care of. During the pandemic, it turned into, oh, no, we, we need a telemedicine visit for that. And I was like, we do? We never used to need one beforehand. What's the difference? Now, obviously, the difference is the payment. So what carriers are trying to do, and this is, you know, unfortunately, it's a story that's been in the making for a long time, is try and move physicians, particularly PCPs, towards more of a capitated payment rate. Right, which is, of course, along the lines of value-based care and the move towards value-based care from a physician perspective, to try and candidly leave the choice in the physician's hands. Look, you know, you can do this in a cost-effective manner over telemedicine, right, and only bring the individual in when they need to be looked at. And it also leaves some choice in the consumer's hand as well, right? Then I can say that, listen, right, all I need is a quick check to make sure that, you know, we're on the same page before I head into a surgery or whatever. I don't need to come in for that, right? I'll come in and I'll do my pre-op right before the surgery as an example. But if I don't need to come in, don't make me. And it becomes more of a conversation between the physician and the consumer versus letting the reimbursement dynamics guide what folks do. So plans are experiencing it acutely. They're feeling it. And then certainly, Right, everybody is trying to get on the global capitation payment bandwagon to make sure that all of the incentives are appropriately aligned. And so, how do these new virtual primary care models relate to that? Because we're seeing some of the carriers offer those where you can just pay a set amount and presumably, you know, you can have all of your primary care virtually. Um, I will just say um, in an interview that we did earlier on this concept of virtual first care, we kind of like the model that is integrated um, with virtual and in-person care, but, you know, it would be helpful to know what direction are the carriers going? And then, um, you know, after, after we hear from that, maybe we'll talk about some parting advice for employers, but, but tell us what you're seeing in terms of this virtual primary care. Absolutely. And so, you know, there, there are very interesting models that are out in the marketplace right now in terms of virtual first primary care. Plans and carriers and even employers are recognizing that like a only virtual system candidly doesn't work, right? At the end of the day, many times physicians do need to lay hands on patients and, and see how they're doing. So there are a variety of different options that plans are considering. So part of these are better connected remote devices, right? So I know of a client of mine, a blue plan that is sending kits to individuals' homes when they sign up for virtual first primary care. That gives them a connected um, blood pressure cuff. It gives them a connected stethoscope, things like that, so that vitals can be taken and transmitted online. That's one approach. And I think we can all agree that while that works and it's a step in the right direction, it's usually not enough, right? The buck can't just stop with that. So then the second thing folks are doing is they are then contracting with a variety of new entrants in the market, like ready responders, dispatch, folks that will then send individuals into people's homes mm -hmm. to get themselves checked out, right? So this is actually very much in line with the Amazon care model, which made a number of waves um, last year in the summertime, right? When they said that they were going to enter the market. The issue is that while all of us are aligned that we want a more integrated system, the logistics around something like this can be very, very challenging, right? Like all of us know uh, and don't like when cable companies come to our house and tell us that they can come from eight o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the evening. And so now if you're having somebody come to your house that is the companion to virtual first primary care, how does that work? And, you know, are we going to turn into the next set of cable companies that nobody wants to hear from and nobody wants to talk to? We don't want that either, right? So, <laughs> so I think that um, the industry is still working through it, but there are a variety of different options that are being explored. And then the last one, of course, is what you and I talked about at the beginning, which is do we partner directly with a primary care office or a large office that has a brick and mortar availability in a particular market and say, okay, 
right? We we'll use a platform to encourage the virtual care visits. And then if you need an in-person visit, you can come to us versus we go to you. It's going to be interesting to see how this whole ecosystem evolves, because I do think we've seen a few people thinking about healthcare at home very differently than they used to earlier, right? So if you were to ask me, I think that's going to become the next big thing as we try and figure out how virtual care takes the forefront here. There's going to be a huge home-based component to it that wasn't there before. So um, before you, I let you go, um, I would love for you to share some advice with our audience that is mainly comprised of um, employer-sponsored plans. So um, people that are in the benefits department at their companies or maybe in charge of all of HR. Um, as you think about virtual care and where it's headed and knowing that the employer voice can help drive the market, what is your advice for what employers should be asking their health plans for? Great question. I would encourage employers to push the plans a little bit, right? So like what we've seen over the past couple of years is there has been a tendency to say, do you offer virtual care? Yes, we're going to check that box and then we're going to move on. Know that based on what Tracy is saying and you know what we've seen in the market, that's not necessarily what your employees want and that's not necessarily what the consumers want either, right? So I, I really like Amwell, I really like Teladoc, but push beyond that, right? Like what else are you doing to help connect the dots across the system so that you don't end up in a place where you're paying more for care that continues to remain disconnected. That would be the big push that I would encourage employers to make as they are talking to their plans and considering where they go next. Okay, well, Pri, thank you so much for joining us today. And I look forward to having you back. There's so many topics I would like to discuss with you. So more to come on this, but thank you so much for being here. And thanks everyone for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Have a good day, everyone.